Welcome to Discover the Difference. I'm Lindsay Bonfiglio with co-host Jamie Reed and Gabe Earl. Today's guest in this podcast is Heather Welpley. She is a coach, speaker, and award-winning author on imposter syndrome and how to silence your inner critic. We're excited to dive into this episode where we get to learn more about navigating that self-critic, what to do, how to get through it, and learn more about Heather and her journey. Please enjoy the episode. Absolutely, Heather. I got to uh, virtually meet you at the Asharks Global um, Imposter Syndrome webinar that you did, and it was fantastic. We had a, a lot of participants here at C3 that attended, and your your message and story just resonated really um, well with us. And you know, I think it's something that we all um, we may know it's there, but really sort of recognizing it's that self-critic voice and imposter syndrome showing up, whether it's personally or professionally. Um, we just, we felt like what a great opportunity to have you kind of speak more to us directly at, at C3, get to know you better and, and share your story. So, um, you know, personally, I, I found moments um, in the webinar when you asked the audience to engage. My, probably one of my favorite takeaways was seeing how many people participated. And so I, I found you did a fantastic job in sort of getting people to say, um, I'm vulnerable and I'm going to share I've felt this way and this yeah. is how it's showed up for me. Um, and so that was something I found really, in, you know, in, inspiring um, of how you got people to sort of say um, this happens and this shows up for me and how do I deal with it and, and what are what are opportunities to better myself in, in addressing it. So that was that was something that, you know, was shared across the board and everyone was like, we got to talk to Heather. She's she's amazing. Let's let's hear her story and kind of what got you to where you are today. Um, so we're excited to learn more about you and your your journey. I love that. Thank you so much for having me. And yes, that that interaction and being able to hear from other people, like people to hear from each other is really important to me. So I'm glad that you picked up on that and enjoyed that as well. Well, so how did uh, how did this come about? You know, you you've had a business yourself in the past, but how did your life's work evolve into a place to where you're now committing to, to take a stage and try to encourage other women to become empowered with their voice? Yeah. So that's a great question around what inspired me to get into this in the first place. You know, part of it goes back a long way in my own personal life. You know, I was always that overachiever, that overdoer, like valedictorian in my high school class. And I overdid everything like in in my life uh, from school to work, my corporate career. And then when I got into my business. And so for me, there was like this personal side of it of I finally, after 25 years of overdoing everything, stopped and asked myself, why? Why am I doing this? And really paused for the first time in my life to listen to that answer, which for me was I was doing it to prove myself. And when I got dug into it, then I started to notice all of these rules and cultural messaging and, and school messaging and work messaging that can connect our worth to achievement, to success, to productivity, to being busy, to getting everything done and realize, oh, wait, I can get things done. I can create an impact without connecting this to my worth. And as I was doing this own deep dive, which that was such a life changing deep dive for me that it led to my first book, which is called An Overachiever's Guide to Breaking the Rules. But at the same time, there was this parallel trajectory that I was doing this personal work. I was also working a lot with women who were in career transition. So I'd started my business, I'd come out of my corporate career, started my business, and I was doing mostly coaching, not speaking. And I was seeing both this overachievingness and feeling like I always have to be there for everyone. I can't disappoint anyone. I have to overdo everything, show up in a lot of the women I was coaching. And I was seeing a lot of imposter syndrome show up for them. I was coaching a lot of women who were in career transition, who were amazing and totally qualified for whatever they wanted to do next. And yet these doubts were coming into their mind of like, well, I don't know if I can really go from being a director to a VP, or I don't know if I can switch industries, or I'm not really sure I'm qualified to switch departments. You know, I've been working in this part of the business for so long. Do I really know enough to switch? And because I was fairly new in my business, I knew a lot of these women personally, like they were friends or they were former colleagues, because that's what happens when you start a business. And I knew how fantastic they were. And I was like, this this is not okay. Like they're experiencing imposter syndrome and being held back from both 
where they want to go and where they could create a great impact and have a great career. And at that time, imposter syndrome was like not quite as much in the vernacular as it is now. And I didn't want to just do one-on-one coaching because I was seeing this show up for so many people. I was like, I want to speak to larger groups about this and just get the word out about to more people about what this is. And not just the imposter syndrome, but also all of these rules that we tend to get handed that can take us away from both our personal joy and freedom, as well as the impact that we want to create. And that's really what motivated me to start speaking, um, was seeing both of these different types of situations in my own life and show up in so many of the women that I was coaching. And that's what led me to really turn the corner and say, okay, let's do this on a bigger scale and talk about it with more people so they know they're not alone, so they know they can do something about it and they can create change for themselves. So it's really the, it's interesting, this idea of proving, um, what, what, what point did you have like awareness that you were doing that, you know, in your life you were trying to prove? And then is there a point in like that you look back into your childhood that was like where this all started or is this just society, um, pressures that have, that, you know, that created it? So interestingly, I'll answer your first question first. When I really stopped and asked myself the question, the answer came up almost immediately. I just hadn't paused throughout my entire life, really, um, to to ask that question. And so when I did, I got the answer of like, oh, I'm proving my worth. I'm proving this. And and of course, it is related to historical things. So I think, you know, I was always the kid who was doing things faster and I love to learn and I was an early reader. So I think I got praised a lot for that as a kid, even though no one in my family would have cared whether I was a valedictorian or not. Like I was not getting pressure of like, you have to get straight A's, you have to do these things. And to be honest, like for a while, I think in elementary and middle school, it was just healthy. It was like I had a lot of curiosity. I loved to learn. I always loved to be doing new things. That was all good. When I got to ninth grade and it suddenly counted, like everything counted. And we were getting that messaging, you know, at school of like everything counts now. Doesn't matter what you did in seventh, eighth grade. But if you want to go to a good college, it all counts now. And that was probably a message that a lot of people needed to hear. I did not need to hear it (laughs) because I already knew it. And it just added this like layer of pressure. And I remember when I got my first first semester report card back and I had the number one, like my class rank was listed at the bottom of my report card and something in there flipped in me. And it was like, I have to stay here. Like I have to now, this is now, I wasn't I did not get straight. I had very good grades in middle school, but I did not have a 4.0. So it was like I I wasn't going into high school expecting to be the valedictorian. But when I saw that on my report card, it, yeah, it flipped a switch in me in some way of like, well, now I have to stay here. This is a possibility. Now I have to stay here. And it just kind of continued. And it wasn't just with grades. It was with leadership and it was with my corporate career and boundaries. And then when I started my business and everything really was on me to a degree, it it amped up even to another level until I finally stopped to ask myself that question. But yeah, it wasn't like specifically parents, but I think there are a lot of general cultural messages that connect our worth to, in the US at least, to achievement and success. So yeah, both of those. I, I, I think we should just try that question all over again, because when Gabe asked it, he was trying to get you to cry. Oh. <laughs> could you give us, could you just make up a different answer that feels really <laughs> emotional? Uh, because he's going to keep trying to make you emotionally <laughs> get there funny. throughout the rest of the podcast. First of all, I don't make anyone do anything. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it, it that does resonate a lot in, for myself, which actually, yeah, Abby's kind of, like I think about, bit, right? yeah, my daughter, his mm-hmm. daughters. But I, I feel like the opposite happened to me when I was eight. I just, I really struggled on how to read. Yeah. Like I had a really challenge with reading and I was very slow in that area. And so what actually, the, what you said was you were really good at it. So you got praise. I was really bad at it, but I wanted to prove that I was smart. Mm-hmm. So I really, it was a, for myself, it was always just proving that I'm not dumb. And, um, you know, I took that into, you know, my life into obviously like what you said is, you know, I wanted to be the best, the number one, the best grades, you know, get into the best school and do the, you know, the best job, you know, all that through as a way to prove that I was smart. Yeah. And so, which was, which is interesting that you kind of coming that the same, same way from the opposite. 
Yeah. And I will say, I think for me, and I, I probably won't cry here, but this does take it to a <laughs> slightly more deeper and personal level. And I talk about this in my second book, so it's not a, not new information for anyone who wants to find it. But is that for me, particularly like in, in middle school, I gained weight really quickly in middle school. And I grew up in that time period when like the thinner, the better was the, you know, the standard of beauty. And I really took on a lot of shame around my weight and how I felt about my body. And it was not consciously done this way, but I do think there was absolutely a connection of like, okay, I don't feel like I can be successful in this realm of like what beauty is supposed to look like or what like desirability is supposed to look like. But I know if I work hard, I can be successful in this other arena. Like I can be good at school. I can be a good leader. I can be a, the captain of both the sports I'm in. Like I can do all of those things because in this other area, like I think I overcompensated in that area for this other part of my life where I didn't. I felt behind. I didn't feel like I was good enough. And I didn't know how to get good enough either. It was like an area of my life that I just didn't there was a standard of beauty out there that I didn't know how I would have I would have loved to have lived up to that standard, to be honest, when I was 14, 15, even 25 years old, like I would have loved to have lived up to that standard. And I didn't know how. Um, and so I think I overcompensated in that other part of my life. Also, even though it was definitely not consciously done at age 15. Oh, that's that was my driver. I was a, so she's got your like uh, mental approach. I was a fat kid. So it was it, it, that created a drive in me too. Okay. all the exact same reason you you just said. Mm -hmm. So then how do you manifest out of that into um, maybe awareness? Like somewhere yeah. in here, you, you turned all this like really high energy into a different kind of awareness. Mm -hmm. Like what triggered you to start realizing that what you were doing was different or at a super exceptional level? in like my business and the speaking and that sort of thing or earlier in sounds yeah. like w from that point your freshman year on you mm -hmm. you hit a level of excellence that's just been at a different level were you aware that's how you were from that moment in time or did it happen down down the line some i think i was i don't think i was aware of the overcompensating although i was very aware that like i was pretty ashamed of my body but i don't think i was aware of the connection at all between those two things and like I said, I had been praised my whole life for being smart and an achiever. And so I think, you know, they, there's complicating overlapping factors there for sure. Um, but yeah, I was pretty aware and I went to a pretty, I went to a public high school, but it was a pretty high achieving high school. And a lot of my friends were pretty similar to me. <laughs> um, and we were all, you know, kind of wanting to do well and wanting to go to good colleges and wanting to be involved in everything. And, um, you know, like I remember at my senior year, I had two friends of mine who were in study hall and all we did for the whole first semester was apply for scholarships during study hall. Like that was what we, you know, and they were primarily academic scholarships, you know, like that's what we used our study hall for. And we'd get together and study for the AP tests. And we had a lot of fun too. I always enjoyed myself and had, had fun, but I was pretty aware that I, overdid things um, and wanted to do well and that I could do well also if I just worked hard enough, which interestingly is something I hear, I think probably from all genders, but I definitely hear from from women specifically like, oh, I just I realized I reached a point in my career in my life where I just simply couldn't outwork everyone. And I think that was true with me as well. Like, I'll just I'll just work as hard. Like, I'll get everything done no matter what you hand to me. I'll get it done. Sure. We'll make that happen. And, um, you know, I, I definitely had a few breakdowns along the way, some emotional ones, but also like I got shingles when I was 30, like no otherwise healthy 30 year old should get shingles and I got shingles. And so there were definitely some consequences that should have been red flags enough for me to stop and really take a deep dive. But it, it took until running my business like when I really was overloaded and thinking, I don't I don't want to live this way for the whole rest of my life. And I got into running my business because I'm passionate about what I'm doing and because I want to create impact and because I want to have freedom. And I'm not feeling that freedom right now. And it was an internal game that needed to be broken down. Yeah. You know, um, you talk about the proving and then the pleasing. I was just thinking about the pleasing and Jamie mentioned my daughter. Um, you know, when you're raising kids, you obviously you you don't, you don't want them to have that imposter syndrome yeah. you don't want them to have that feeling of pleasing and you just want them to have that strong self-worth like how do you praise um them and not 
where where it's not internalized as oh i'm now they're they're doing it to please versus they're doing it for their own internal um feeling n- not of who they are but um because they they want they want to do it it's such a good question i've reflected on this for myself because i'm like you know it's not I think it would have been worse had no one recognized or praised me like that for sure would have been way worse. And so I, I'm not sure I have the perfect answer for you. And I, I don't personally have kids myself, but I'll, I'll say a couple of things. So one, the one thing that I that I've read over and over again, so I feel comfortable putting it out there, not being a parent or a child psychologist is allowing our kids to fail um, and not not saving them, but also not criticizing them but so you know supporting them like being realistic about it like it's okay to fail also what are you learning from this what do you want to do differently next time and that can go to really young ages but also not like scooping them up and saving them like allowing them to fail at different times in their life so that they know that they can well one that they're worth that it's okay to fail like that their worth is not they aren't as a failure as a human just because they have failed or done poorly at something or have worked really hard for something even and not gotten what they wanted, um, you know, that that's okay. And it builds resilience and it's not connected to their worth. So that's, that's one thing that I have read multiple times um, that, and, and interestingly, I've read that it is, we don't offer as many of those um, opportunities for girls in some of it actually has to do with sports, even like when sports a fewer, and I'm sure this is changing, but like fewer girls, girls are more likely to drop out of sports when they get competitive, when they get older. And so you're not, like it, sports, you're getting so many opportunities because you're not going to win them all. Like you're just not. And you realize that you can go out the next game and play hard again. And um, so lots of different possibilities there. The other thing I'll say is interestingly, I typically work with like adult women inside companies. You know, that's who I coach. That's leadership development programs. That's speaking. And in April of this year, I spoke at a, I was called a women's leadership conference, but it was for primarily middle school and high school girls. So there were 80 of them. And then about 20 or 25 adults were in the room as well. And I spoke on all of these topics around proving, pleasing, and perfecting, not specifically imposter syndrome, but more like the rules that you get handed. And I talked to the class ahead of time too, and they shared, so when they were juniors and seniors, they shared so many so many things and they were so open about these rules they get handed and connecting their worth to achievement and also feeling like they need to tone themselves down and um it was hard to hear like i'm not gonna lie it was hard to hear and also made me realize like wow we really we need to be having these conversations earlier and this concept of the rules seems to be a really good entry point um for for all ages um and you know because it's something we all can feel once you're introduced the idea of like what rules have you been handed about how you are and are not supposed to show up what standards and um it just feels like it seems to be a really good entry point into conversation and realization so yeah i don't i don't know what, what i'm curious what you all have seen either with yourselves or with younger people around you on that kind of rules front yeah I you know that really um resonates with me I I have two daughters um one being 10 and and she's a mini me for I mean inside and out right and one of the things that I've always sort of carried with me that I think aligns with what you're saying is um my dad would tell myself you know my early climbing career and stuff talk talk to little Lindsay right talk to your eight ten year old version of yourself and would you be this harsh on yourself of that self-worth and did I get lucky and can I outwork people and and I I see that in my daughter and one of the the biggest things is I I see the mirror in parenting her right so when she's upset because she got a B I'm like why are we upset over a B that's great she's like well it's not an A and she's devastated and the world's falling apart you know you talk about um, allowing them to fail and and so with her I always say did you work hard for that B I did I, I worked really hard I said I'm like then that's a great be, I rather have a B that you worked really hard than an A just because, you know, you you showed up and happened to, you know, do well on it. And so I, I do, you know, in, in your question and asking how does that show up, I, I find um, a lot of the things you say show up as a parent when you're speaking to your kids, it's, it's often a mirror back to yourself because we don't necessarily treat ourselves and parent us the way we would our own kid. I think there's a lot more forgiveness and grace and and sort of working through that. And so for me, it, it is a great reflection of saying, um, I should probably speak to myself in the same voice that I am to my, you know, 10 year old. Yeah. Um, and, and also how I do to my colleagues and my peers, right? So if I'm, I'm coaching and helping or mentoring someone, 
I, I use a different voice than I do with with myself. And so I, I find that to be really um, interesting. So I'm so glad you brought up the parallel with colleagues, too, because you're right like that, that we're just most of us, you know, I don't know the percentage, but most of us are way harder on ourselves than we are on anyone around us. And so that consciously talking to yourself like you would your child or like a colleague or a good friend like that, that's such a good practice. So I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. Yeah, I wonder if that is part of the rules, you know, the the self criticism. Um, you know, my I was thinking of my my wife's really good at, you know, talking about, you know, the like kind of what you said, the effort and the process and the journey rather than the achievement, <laughs> because the 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 then then the then it's more making an internal about Input you know yourself. what what you're doing versus that the result, okay. um, and the results will come if you're feeling like passionate about it or you love it or you're into it or, and you're going to work hard at it. Um, and that's what the great coaches do. I mean, because you're, you're going to lose games at certain levels of life. Right. So I think the great coaches focus on input, not output, you know, but it's easy as a parent to maybe get caught up on, on the output, you know, because it's impacting like going to college or whatever it may be, which is back to the rules, back to the rules. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and that like cer- certain things in our life can just be fun for the process and not for any result. You know, I think we get we get some of those rules too that like everything has to be productive or you have to monetize it or you have to be competitive with it or whatever. And it's like, oh, and that there's nothing wrong with any of that. And also we get, we get to have some things in our life that we enjoy the process and the outcome makes no difference at all. And I think that can be true at, at all ages. Like you just get to do something because you enjoy it, not because of, not for any specific result. Well, I, that's a good one. Uh, I, I actually reflect on that quite a bit because, you know, for high achievers that are really pushing hard, I'm, I'm thinking professional setting now. Yeah. Uh, me and I were just talking about it recently where it's like, I'm doing the opposite of you. I'm like, I'm pushing everybody really hard right now. And, uh, you know, the <laughs> stress and pressure that comes with trying to hit goals and objectives and things like that can sometimes create a little bit of a cloud that, you know, you carry around with you. So... Mm-hmm people who are really trying to do special things or, you know, extraordinary goals that they're never have hit before and they're pushing hard. Like how do you coach them to also enjoy the journey and not just the destination? That's such a good point. I think it depends on the person. Um, You know, I think some of it is, is noticing in your own life, like part, part of it, I think is creating some space to do things you just love and enjoy and, and giving yourself some space to calm down. Um, uh, like for me, I know I can get up into my head and my energy can like move upward really, really, really quickly. <laughs> um, and I need to ground myself. And so even some of that body work, I think, um, Jamie, I think you, did I see on LinkedIn that you are a breath work coach? Is that? Yeah. So like things like breath work, like I do breath work every single morning now for five minutes and it has changed my life Um, because that grounding into my body and realizing I don't just have to be wrapped up in my head. Like I get to reconnect into my body and do things for fun, do things from a place um, of grounded energy because like I still enjoy achieving. I still enjoy being productive. Like I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And like I've written two books. I mean, when I wrote my first book, people were like, isn't it ironic that you wrote this book about letting go of overachieving and like isn't writing a book kind of an overachievery thing to do? And I was like, that is an excellent point. <laughs> um, and also it didn't feel like I it was an overachievery thing to do because it was coming from this grounded place within me. And so I think, you know, when, when you are that super high achiever, giving yourself space for fun, getting like trying, you know, getting out of your head and into your body and doing practices, whether it's deep breathing or hiking or going for a walk without having anything in your ears. So you you're not listening to a podcast, you're not having your phone on you unless you have to, for some reason. And like, you're creating some space just to be you and to slow down and to slow your mind down and to slow your body down. And that allows you, and I'm not, I don't like the messages of like rest so that you can be more productive. Um, but it's about creating some space, you know, so that you have, you have that space to listen to your own voice and to calm down. And then you can focus where you need to focus at work in other parts of your life and actually have the capacity and energy and desire to do that there as well. Wow. 
Is is that where you got the title of the book, Grounded Wild Wildness, that kind of the juxtaposition between being grounded and wild? Yeah, the two of those together. So like, because I think it was a combination of I was reading a lot of books and things at the time about like wildness and that, that didn't feel quite right to me. Like that just kind of this all over the place, just break all the rules for the sake of breaking them, you know, be wild. That didn't feel quite right to me. But when you add the groundedness to it, then that's just freedom while also being aligned to your values and being aligned into what feels good and being aligned to the impact that you want to create. And um, yeah, so it's like this freedom, the grounding enables the freedom and enables the wildness without it becoming untethered or rebellious just for the sake of pushing against things. Um, It gets to be grounded and aligned in who you are. And that's really where that that title came from for me. Can we maybe... I, I want to shift into the uh, you know man versus woman realm for yeah. a second. And somebody was sharing a story with us about how their mom was um, this kind of like top dog sales leader in a, in a big organization, much bigger than ours, but in our industry. And what you're familiar with through Asherax. And uh, they talked about how she had a fear. This was in the 80s mm. that you know she was a top salesperson was going to leave to go out on pregnancy and then you know, they're going to take her book and give it away and all these things, which didn't end up happening. She came back. She continued to be the top sales dog when she came back. Um, but that probably happens a lot, right? In the industry. So how does this all cast into, you know, that, that, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like sex or man versus yeah. woman kind of, um, roles. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I do want to be clear, men are absolutely handed rules as well. <laughs> and I would be interested here, like the one that comes up often that, that I hear is like that it's not it's weakness to be vulnerable if you are a man or to cry or to kind of show some of those softer emotions. Obviously, that's evil. You know, all of this is evolving on a consistent basis. But I do want to be clear, like everyone is handed rules, but also what you're talking about, you know, I, I was reading uh, Fierce Self-Compassion by Krista Neff a few years ago. And I loved how she captured this. And I'm not going to quote it exactly right, but she's like, everyone, regardless of your gender identification, is handed rules that are not great for us from a psychological and well-being standpoint. However, the rules that get handed to men tend to lead to more status and power, and the rules that get handed to women tend to lead to less status and power. And I thought that was such a good way of phrasing it and um, uh, that they're not good for anyone, but you know, that there is there is a difference between the two. And I do hear what you're talking about from people of, you know, fear of around pregnancy or taking a break, or there's very well researched, you know, coming like coming out of the pandemic, there's more, been more flexibility in a lot of workplaces. And there's an assumption that more women are going to be likely to take workplaces up on greater flexibility and hybrid work schedules. And we know that people who are in the office more and getting seen more are more likely to get pay increases. So it's like this interesting thing of it's not always direct, but there is indirect or um, and, and some of those things do do take a toll on your career. And we we absolutely do know on the whole, and this is not a comment on any individual person or relationship because there's a ton of amazing fathers out there. We also know that women tend to carry more of mothers tend to carry more of an emotional load. And even in a very equitable, you know, I'm talking about like cisgender heterosexual relationships, even a super equitable relationship on paper, the woman is like the more likely to remember that they have to do an early daycare pickup on Thursday. Or like I had a friend who was a teacher and every single one of her students, the mom was the first emergency contact. And then the dad was second um, in every single one of her 25 students in her classroom. And so, you know, those things are a reality that are that is still out there, whether you are a mother or not. It's a reality. It's evolving. And and we still need to create more change in those spaces. Yeah, it's so funny because I've gotten the emergency calls yeah. from school and they're like, hey, we couldn't reach her. Like, yeah. So we're calling you and they're like, yeah. oh, I was like, I thought it was because it was really bad. Yeah. So they're calling yeah, dad, yeah. you know, like, uh. What you you yeah. actually chose to come back to work early. I did. Does any of this play into that? It does. It's um, you know, for me, um, my career has been such a big sort of I look at my life as slices of pie, right? I have my mom role, my sister role, you know, friend. Um, and career has always been something I, I loved. Again, very similar type A, high achieving. Um, no one necessarily put those pressures, but whatever bar I set for myself, I wanted to, you know, exceed. And 
having um having my second daughter and, and going out on leave, I I struggled with postpartum anxiety um, and being home, and and I realized how much of my identity and interactions were wrapped up in in C3 and my peers and my colleagues and those those day to day interactions. And fortunately, I have such great team. We were still you know um, texting and engaged and all that kind of stuff. But I I missed the not about uh, work. no not about work. <laughs> None of those about work. Um, I like but the visual I, I there. missed feeling yeah I I missed feeling productive right yeah. like the hundredth diaper and you know all that sort of stuff and and then there's shame and guilt that comes with that of I'm supposed to be glowing and loving being out you're like this is tough this is hard and and I I needed to fill that cup right and so you know when I reached out and I said can I would you be okay if I start maybe part-time like start to dip my toe in the pool and they're like yes um, but you know, we'll, we'll help you with boundaries. So you, you, you know, kind of get back into it. So I, I did. And interestingly enough, my husband's a stay at home dad now. And, um, he, his experience of, you know, um, everything that I think a lot of stay at home moms feel, he now has that perspective mm-hmm. and you, you talk about mental load. Um, and you know, God, God bless him and all the other husbands and partners out there, but He's like, what, what can I do? How can I help? Give me a list. And I'm like, the list means I'm doing more work <laughs> for the thing, right? I'm like, that doesn't actually take the help out. But um, it, it is something that I think him as, a, as a, a partner gets more exposure to everything that goes into that dynamic and the full-time job that it is being a stay-at-home parent. Um, and so it's been an interesting dynamic in our relationship to kind of learn that as, as I come home from work and feel this rush and need to, you know, take care of the baby and relieve him. And, and so we're, we're working through all of that, what it looks like. But um, I think I think there are a lot more um, fathers and parents who yeah. who also miss out on opportunities for the PTA meetings and the the events where maybe not by choice. Um, but those rules are I've got to go to work conversely, yes. right? On on the male side of of I need to be there. If I don't, I won't be up for the promotion. And and I really love, especially at C three, but we have people, I, I gotta go, I've got my, you know, kids baseball at two. And and that's wonderful. I think, especially as you said, post pandemic, yeah. that flexibility of of on both fronts, just parents in general being able to prioritize spending time without fear of does this impact my career progression, opportunity, things like that? And so I, I, I like the movement and the direction things are going um, in that regard. But do you guys watch Mr. Mom together? Uh, we should. Uh, have you? Yeah. That'd be a Friday that. night, yeah. open a bottle of wine yeah. and yeah. see how true to life it is. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd be, you know, kind of curious to, you know, kind of hear what, you know, what are those, what are the biggest rules that, you know, I would say women face? And then what are things that, you know, that we can do to, you know, help break through those? Because I, I mean, I, th- I think what Lindsay was talking about, there's a healthy aspect to, you know, coming back to work and mm-hmm. being part of feeling um, that part of being part of something and something that you enjoy doing and the, the human interaction and the connection and all, all that stuff. Because, I mean, Lindsay's badass at her job <laughs> as, as well, uh, separately. Um, but there's the part that you said is, well, how much is that also connected to your self-worth? Yes. Um, and how do you start to separate that um, so that it's, you're doing it out of the, your own personal joy and, and love for it versus making yourself like, are you a good person if you don't do it? Oh my gosh. You just, there's so many things in there. Like I, I, I love that you caught onto that kind of nuance of it's less about what you do and more about the motivation and energy behind it. Like I, I do work a little bit less now. I definitely have better boundaries now for sure um, that I've done, you know, kind of gone through this work. But I also like I'm still running a business. I'm still doing things. And yet I don't feel like I can actually experiment more. I can do more things because I don't feel like my worth is connected to that achievement and success, which interestingly, I think has actually made me more successful to disconnect that. But then that's kind of a weird little mind wrapping thing too. So, um, you know, it's an interesting thing. I think some of the common rules that I see from women, and it's very individualized. So I don't want to say, I think the, the biggest thing that any person can ask themselves is to start to notice what rules have I been handed? Like what's motivating me behind how I'm showing up 
and that could be related to how much I'm working. It could be how I feel like I should and shouldn't use my voice. Can I speak up in this meeting? Can I be direct? Or do I need to ask a question? Do I, you know, do I need to say yes to every single meeting invite I get? I mean, just a whole myriad of kind of what's the energy and motivation and belief behind the actions is a great question for anyone to ask. Because some of these go back, you know, like I, I did a session on, it's called Creating Your Own Rules for Success, but it was on a lot of these rules. And it was with an all gender audience, a large team. And a woman came up to me afterwards and she was like, you know, I realized that she was like in her early 30s. She said, I realized that when I was growing up, I was always told that I was the role model for my brothers and sisters. And I still feel like I have to be the role model, even though I'm like 33 years old. I feel like I still have to be the role model. So anyone asking themselves these questions, that's going to be a really helpful exercise because then you can choose start to, to notice and choose like, wait, where where do I want to keep following that? Or where do I want to start to break that down and pick a different rule to follow or a different way of approaching things? Some of the most common ones I hear from women that show up in the workplace that can be challenging um, and they relate to both how we're showing up at work and well-being kind of across the board are like some combination of I have to be responsible for everything and everyone. I have to keep everyone happy. And I'm not allowed to disappoint anyone. Um, sometimes people will separate those out and sometimes they kind of all get lumped together. But like, for example, you know, I've seen way more men question a meeting invite and say like, do I really need to be at that meeting? Or do I just feel like I need to show up? Uh, do I do I feel like I can say no to that project or have a conversation about whether that's really the imp- highest impact of and good of my work or or not and like being and part of that is part of that's internal and the rules that we've been handed throughout our whole lives sometimes it's more expectations from others there's a mix around that but particularly in coaching I've worked a lot with women who have you know transitioned into bigger leadership roles and there comes a point where like you can't be responsible and involved in every single little thing like it's just not going to work and that's a transition that a lot of leaders have to go through. And I've seen it be especially challenging if you've gotten this rule that you have to be responsible for everything, keep everyone happy, and you aren't allowed to disappoint anyone. So I don't know. That's that's one I've seen across the board. There are lots of them. I'd be curious, like, what have you seen either for yourself or in the women that you've worked with, some of these rules now that we've talked about them? You know, one, one of the things, given a we, we talked about this a little bit with you in the beginning because Gabe doesn't like to say no mm, to anybody yeah. or anything. Arlene is a lot like that too. And she had this client who didn't pay their bills, all this stuff, went into collections, moved somewhere else. And they're pushing her to have a meeting. She's like, I'm so over these people. I'm like, tell them freaking no. Yeah. I, I use a different F word, but I swear. Like, uh, <laughs> and she's fighting this. Um, I think it's like not wanting to disappoint or. Yeah you know, or not wanting to tell some other human being no. Mm-hmm. And the reframe that I don't, I don't know if she took it or not, um, since, especially being the husband, but I'm like, you know, at work, we talk about reframing it and saying yes to yourself, yeah. not no yeah. to that. Yes. And then if you're not saying yes to yourself, you know, frequent enough, you're going to burn out, you're going to whatever, emotionally depleted or something like that. And so that's a reframe we talked through that. quite a bit. So I see that show up a lot. Yeah. I think another another one, and, and you touched on this a little bit ago about, you know, your your voice mm-hmm. um, and, and your authentic, authentic yeah. voice. Um, one of the things that I see, and, and we know DEI is a big, you know, initiative across the board. Um, and there's kind of this new letter that's surfacing and be and meaning be of belonging, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. so you can have diversity, you can have inclusion, but then when you're there, Do you feel like you belong? And, you know, Heather, one of the things that you talked about in the webinar was, um, and as it shows up as imposter syndrome is, did I get lucky? Yeah. And I find that a lot. Um, I I even know I did a little self-reflection and and I shared that with the organization when, you know, I said, hey, here's the recorded meeting. If you didn't make it, Um, there there had been moments where I I, in promotions and and climbing sort of the corporate ladder was am I really good at my job or do people just really like me? Am I lucky because my leader thinks like, oh, Lindsay's great. We couldn't not, right? And so there's those moments where you're like, did my my work and my efforts and my intelligence, did that get me here? Um, And so do I truly belong? And I find that that criticism um, happens often in in companies and and women in particular when when I connect with. Um, And and in hoping that there's... um, 
recognition for your work and not just convenience or right time, right place. And yeah. and you sort of talked about how to diminish that that voice. So I'd love to hear you kind of expand on how do you address that? Because I do think that's one that um, a lot of women do feel <laughs> sitting at the proverbial table, right? Of, yeah. of, did I just get here because people like me or did I deserve it? Um, how do you how do you sort of help people through that that inner voice? Yeah. Oh, my God. So many, so many different, so many different ways. And I love that you brought that up because you're right. And the belonging can feel like a lot of different things depending on the person, how it's showing up. Like it could be, did I just get here because I was lucky or because people liked me as a person? And so they promoted me into this role. Or, you know, for for like a woman of color, she might be looking around and being like, no one here is like me. Like, do I belong here? And certainly other underrepresented groups as well. So, you know, there's a lot of different or I have a different style than everyone else here. You know, do I do I belong? There's it can show up in so many different ways and, and it can make you question yourself. And, and it, there's a historical reasons for that. So I think to put it in a little bit of historical context, you know, like 50 years ago, you wouldn't have belonged there. You wouldn't have been there at all. <laughs> and so you, depending on who you are, might have gotten some of those messages even growing up. There's been a huge generational shift. I mean, like people my parents' age, a lot of the women got the message they could literally only be a nurse, a secretary, or a teacher. And those were their three. And then I grew up thinking I could do anything. That is a huge shift in a single generation. And so we're still working through some of those generational expectations and historical uh, expectations. And they can show up in our minds too. You know, that history can show up in our minds. And so I think there's, you know, a couple of things come up for me. One is the individual side of this, which is yeah, um, one thing I talked about in the webinar that I think is a really helpful tool is is writing down your actual accomplishments and you're giving yourself the evidence that you are qualified, that you are successful. And if you have a hard time coming up with that yourself, get a person to do it with you, whether that's a manager or a colleague or someone who you know is a big supporter. And you're not trying to like overinflate. You're just trying to get an accurate perspective on what's going on. And then another one is something you talked about, um, Jamie, around reframing, like reframing your thoughts and choosing, uh, like noticing, oh, I'm coming up with this thought that I don't belong here. What's a different or that I don't deserve to be here? What's a different thought that I can choose that is more empowering, that's more accurate? Like, Hey, I was chosen here for a reason. Um, there and I'm here to contribute or I'm here to create an impact or you know, whatever it might be. And then choosing to act on that can be can be helpful as well. So there's a lot of different tools. And yeah, anyone who's listening and is curious about this, I'd recommend go the webinar should still be available because we walked through quite a few different tools on that um, for yourself. And then also just breaking down some of the systemic reasons as well, um, you know, being more equitable where we can, noticing when microaggressions are showing up, noticing, you know, before you give feedback on someone's style, pausing and saying, hmm, is any a part of this based in bias? And I'll just give you a quick example. Like I got feedback occasionally through my corporate career that I took in too much, I will fully admit as well, like I internalized this feedback too much. And it was that I was too direct. And I also internalized it too much. And I think it's really unlikely it ever would have been given to a man. And because that's just, you know, women are, there's a much, much narrower bridge of acceptability for how women can show up with a, with their voice. Um, and so, you know, pausing before you give feedback on, on style in particular, not that you shouldn't give it, just pause and say, hmm, is... is how do I want to tee this up? Or would I give this to a man? Would I give this to, if you're thinking about giving this to a woman of color, would I give the same feedback to a white woman showing up in the same way, you know, and just starting to break down some of the systemic reasons that imposter syndrome exists in the first place. How, how would, how do you recommend inviting that feedback so that we can have more awareness, you know, in the business space, um, you know, where, where, you know, there might, because a lot of times there's an unconscious bias, yes. right? Mm -hmm. um, and people are, mm -hmm. you know, innocently just saying things or, or in certain ways or doing things in certain ways that may be um, received, um, you know, that received in a, in a way that they don't, they're not intending. Well, we've received that feedback before, right? We're, I think we have a pretty good atmosphere, generally speaking, but somebody will give us some feedback and you're like, oh, there was no intent there. You know, and, yeah. and so we're, so to flip that, we're trying to be more intentional yeah. about it. it um, but I think what Gabe's saying is like, rather than holding on to it and not giving the feedback, if you're feeling that, 
um, what's a recommendation on addressing it so that you are breaking those norms down, uh, especially in our, like in our industry, you know, it's, it, we're seen as male, pale and stale, yeah. you know, it, it's, <laughs> it, it's really, you know, two it, white guys sitting here, right here. Yeah. Are, like, and, and it, and it is seen, you know, a lot of times, you know, in our industries, there's a good, good old boys club and all that. And obviously we're, we want to break that, you know, yeah. break those barriers down and, and not be, be like that. Um, so I guess the question is, is like, how do we invite that feedback as, as an organization, um, so that we can continue to break those barriers and, and, you know, start to be conscious in conscious in the bias so yeah. that we can remove the bias. I, I, I just have to point out first, I love what you said around a lot of this isn't intentional. So we're trying to bring intention to it and you are a hundred percent right. And I have no doubt that I have said things and done things that have not been received well and and rightfully so have not been received well throughout my life like we all we all have those um so what can you do about it first of all just having conversations like this is part of it i mean the fact that we're recording this you're going to be sharing this with your employees it's going to be out there like that is that's part of it is you're already giving people permission to give feedback or to have these conversations or you're showing and telling people that you are open to this um, and then I think the next step is, you know, so one is like consciously telling people like, hey, if you're seeing something, I want to hear about it. If I say something that I'm, you know, is not coming across in the right way, please, I want to I want to hear about that. And then when someone has the courage to come and talk to you about it, give them your full attention. Listen, it doesn't mean that all that feedback is 100 percent, you know, accurate and right and all of the things, but taking the taking the time to really listen. And if you are in a space when that person approaches you that you can't listen, like you're you're just too many things are going on and you have to get to a meeting, saying something like, I, this is important and I want to give you my full attention and I can't do it right now. Can we schedule a time for Friday so that we can have this conversation and I can really understand where you're coming from so that I can learn? So you're, you know, you're giving people, so there's both kind of the conscious things that you're telling people up front and then you're backing it up with your actions. And then I think the third part of this, and any of us can do this, is when when you see something happening in front of you, like a micro, I'll just give an example that I've heard from some people, like, you know, uh, let's say a someone is promoted into a role and maybe that person isn't even part of the conversation. A woman's promoted into a leadership role, but two other, three other people are having a conversation and someone says, you know, she only got that role because they need some more diversity in the senior ranks or something like that. Like that's pretty direct, but indirect or direct. And you, if you hear something like that, it's really easy to just laugh or not say anything. And you don't have to be super confrontational about it, but you can say like, what leads you to say that? Or can we talk a little bit more about that? Or even just like, oh, I don't, I don't see that that's true at all. Like I'm super excited that Kelly got promoted into that role. Here's why I'm excited. This is what I think she's going to bring to it. And so, you know, being aware of that and addressing those in day-to-day -day conversations as well. So those are some of the things I'm curious. Lindsay, do you have anything to add to that or things that you guys have talked about at C3? Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, uh, coincidentally, we actually went through a leadership development course um, and it was called um, your five voices and sort of oh, identifying cool. your foundational voice. And, um, you know, Jamie, for example, he's considered a, a pioneer. Um, and, and in the exercise, which he even talked about, there's things where pioneer voices typically have unintended consequences mm -hmm. um, where they suck the air out of the room, for lack of a better term, right? And so, Great. you know, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, she said, let the yes. Yes. I feel, yeah, I, I can have that dialogue with Jamie, but, um, you know, and, and that's not to say he shows up that way. That's just typically a natural um, default voice of his. Yeah. And so... He, he um, worked on a couple things that says, as this voice, what can I do so that I don't create the perception of I'm dismissing your idea or I just want to move quickly through it? And in recognizing other voices on the opposite, it's sort of end of the spectrum or decimal is, you know, a, a nurturer or guardian voice. And so Jamie creates space to say, I want to hear the nurturer or guardian speak first, right? And and elicit that that feedback. And so that those are sort of things we're trying to intentionally say, how do we create it? Because I think you you hit the, you know, head on the nail in that it's okay to always say we want to hear feedback, right? I mean, businesses do it, HR leaders do it, surveys, we want to hear feedback. But when you're actually receiving the feedback, if you're not actively listening, you're you're not gonna create 
the um, environment and the space for people to truly feel like they can provide that. Something, you know, Gabe, I, I always hear him do is he says, are you open to feedback? Mm -hmm. He leads with with that question. And so if he wants to provide something back, it sort of shifts the receiver to say, well, I'm, am I open or is this not a good place? And so um, I do think that's that's really important. Something I try to take an intentional approach with is is really creating the I'm just here to listen. I'm not here to already. What is my response going to be? Yeah. Am I already trying to um, solve for um, and so sometimes I say, would you like for me to hear you or would you like for me to help you? Yeah, right? right. And that sort of distinguishing um, aspect of it, I think, um, hopefully creates a more um, open environment where people are comfortable sharing. So we we do know what can we do better and, and how do we address things? So that, that's kind of what I've found that's as well. So good. I like those five voices. And the other thing that came up for me and you're saying that is like, sometimes we do need to apologize or ask like, what do I need to do to repair what's got, what, what has happened here or what I've said, or the, or sometimes it's just a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Like this relationship is important to me. And I can see that I, yes, it was unintentional, but I did some damage to it. So like, what do I, what do we need to do? What do I need to do to repair it and move forward? So there's, you know, there's times and places for all of these different things. And also the book, um, Inclusion on Purpose by Rushika Talshian has been, has, is great. She really, uh, it's yes, it's about DEI, but she really centers women of color in the book, and it's a it's a different perspective and one that I found I learned a lot from in um uh, in reading through it. So I think that's a a great could be a great resource also. <laughs> yeah, buy some. Is there? Well, I don't know if uh, Mia warned you that we were gonna move uh, into wrapping yes. up the yes. podcast with rapid fire or not, rapid but. Fire. As a pioneer of voice, I'm I'm going to turn to the nurturer to have space <laughs> to kick off the rapid fire. I, actually, she's a connector. She's a connector. Oh, connector! Dang it! I know. I'm in the middle. I'm a I'm a connector. Um, Ooh, I bet I'm a connector too. That feels even just that word. I'm like, hmm, I think that's probably what I am. <laughs> Man, it's yeah, it's his listening yeah. issue. Yeah. <laughs> Gabe, Gabe and I, Gabe and I are, are connectors. My my ten year old actually um, attended, and and she. Um, yeah, I know. She ten year old with you know thirty thirty Love of us uh, uh, leaders in the group, and she um, she ranked the same as Jamie. Her, her the two of them are little peas peas in the pod. So I've got a future leader. Gabe one may day. have Lindsay, but I'm connected with. Yeah, her. he's connected <laughs> with my daughter. Um, all right, are you ready? For I am ready. I took a sip of water. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Wonderful. These are these are intense. Okay. 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 What's your favorite time of day? Oh, you know, right now in the summer, I have a second floor deck that is like surrounded by trees and it's covered and it feels like a tree house. So I love sitting out there like at dinner time and early evening as the sun is setting and I the birds are chirping around me and it's just super calm and I'm not listening to music. I'm not doing anything. I'm either just eating or sitting. And yeah, that's my favorite time of day right now in the summer. Uh, speaking of eating, what's your uh, weirdest food combination? Weirdest? Oh, I don't even. I don't know. I I uh, I don't. Know if I have like an a, answer. A topping to that. on something, or I mean, I like peanut butter with like almost everything, so that might be <laughs> uh, peanut butter and anything from the farmers market. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I have any like weird combinations that come up immediately though. <laughs> I I end my night with taking a spoon of peanut butter and dipping it in Nutella. Oh. And my kids hate it because I'll like I'll, I I I'm not double dipping it, but I'm dipping to one and then there yeah, yeah and oh, they're man. like you know like the little candy. peanut butter marks in it. Uh, your cost yeah. needs to that sounds amazing. Um, <laughs> is, it, is, is there a singular experience that you can think back on in your life where, in reflection, you're like, well, I I really learned something that shifted the way I look at life. Yeah, studying abroad. So I studied abroad in uh, Costa Rica. I studied my undergrad degree is actually in conservation biology, and then I have a master's degree in human resource development. So my undergrad, I went, I did one semester in tropical ecology in the middle of the rainforest in Costa Rica. And then the next semester, I went to Seville, Spain, which is a city of 800,000 people. And so the combination of the two of like two different cultures, learning a language, literally middle of the rainforest Monteverde to a, the biggest city I'd ever lived in at that time um, was just a huge learning, cross-cultural learning. And the biggest thing is I remember 
my whole semester before I went to Costa Rica, I had done a semester long project in biology on shade grown coffee plantations. And I had a very strong opinion that every, every single coffee plantation should be shade grown. And I got to Costa Rica in Monteverde, which is a fairly cloudy place. It's the cloud forest. You're up in elevation. Learned in the first week there that I was totally wrong and that the that the books didn't tell me everything. And that was such a good realization to be like, oh, sometimes you have to get your feet on the ground and to really see all the different perspectives and see what's happening outside. Like the books are good too and they're a great starting point. And, and also just take in other perspectives and other cultures and see what's really happening. And that has, that has carried with me in you know so many different situations and kind of my life life perspective since then. Yeah. Can you uh, can you share with us a, a cause that really resonates and is important to you, an organization or you know a movement? Um, what what what's important to you? Yeah, two immediately come up, and I'm not even sure. Kind of, I'm trying to figure out how to get more involved in these. So one is our youth, uh, particularly teenage girls, and really introducing these concepts like that. When I spoke at that high school, middle school, and high school leadership forum, it really it made a big impact on me in a way that I that I wasn't expecting. Um, and I've worked with youth in my past, but never quite in this way. And hearing the pressures that they felt and these rules that they felt, I was like, how, how can we start to dismantle this at an earlier age? And I don't have an answer to that, um, but that's one. And then another one is around um, a, a climate change, I think is, is huge. I live in, I used to live in Minnesota. I live in Colorado where I like literally see the effects and feel the effects of climate change every single day now. And um, that's really, really big and uh, significant for me as well. As well. We should, um, we should get Heather the uh, information for yeah. Rising Girls. It's the uh, Women's Youth um, Empowerment Nonprofit. We're partnering with them for upcoming um, uh, social events, but we should we should get you that information. I know it focuses a lot on uh, particularly girls and, and youth yeah. and empowering them. So. That would be awesome. Thank that you. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, this one's really serious. Um, what's your current um, TV character that you love? TV character? Um... Oh my god! I mean, well, so I will fully admit my, my TV tastes are like I just binge watch Bridgerton. So you know that's kind of where <laughs> where I'm coming from. Um, although I would, so I would say El- Eloise Bridgerton is probably my favorite TV character uh, right now. I, I she's bucking the status quo and, and trying to figure out her place in the world, and and I like it. <laughs> all right, last one, and you'll have survived rapid fire. What? Uh... Of all the family vacations you've taken uh, around the world, where's your favorite vacation spot? Ooh, okay, so this wasn't a family one, so I'm going to change it a little bit. But I went with two friends to Colombia in 2009, and it was just on this verge of like when Colombia hadn't been super safe for travelers, and it had just become safe. So there were hardly any travelers there. It was just that all three of us speak Spanish, so we were able to get around really well. We stayed in this like... uh, really remote house on the beach where you had to wear earplugs at night because the waves were crashing so loudly that the waves would keep you awake and um, ate lobster and coconut rice and uh, saw carnival. And I mean, just, it was just really incredible. And we had a lot of fun. So it was this really wonderful, like three friends had a ton of fun. It was adventurous. It felt like we were exploring a new place. We ate great food and it felt like we were on kind of the cusp of something that was going to be really big and popular in a couple of years. But we were getting in there at the beginning and and all of that together just made for a fantastic vacation. That sounds like Cartagena. Is that we went to we went to Car- we went to Barranquilla for Carnival for a night and then to um and then out to the beach, so east, I believe, of Cartagena, kind of by Parque Tirona. And then we ended in Cartagena. And Cartagena was absolutely beautiful. Have you been there? Yeah. Stunning. You're ready to go on vacation. It's a, it's a, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I was, it, was just, it just made me think of it as you're describing. Yes, it was yes, just fantastic. It was just everything fantastic. About it everything was, about it was wonderful. Was, was wonderful. Well, so what's uh, what's next in store for Heather? Yeah, um, I mean, p- part of I'm continuing to do some of the things that I have done. I mean, so speaking and coaching and leadership development. Um, but I will also say, well, well two things. One, I'm, I'm considering writing a really short short book that might even be like an ebook on applying. You know, because the the book, the two books I've written are both personal and professional to really take that in a, a leadership realm of like, what does it look like to apply these concepts specifically to leadership and leading with grounded confidence? So I'm, I'm considering that. 
And I'm also halfway through the first draft of writing a fantasy novel for upper upper elementary kids. And I have no idea what I'll, I'm 20,000 words in and I have no idea if it's good or if anyone will ever read it or if it will be a focus in the future. But I'm absolutely, I mean, going back to like process versus outcome, I am loving the process of being just super creative and putting words on paper and spending some of my time that way. And and I have no idea what will happen with it. And it still feels 100% worth it because uh, it's just so much fun. And yeah, so we'll we'll see what's that too. So I'm exploring both avenues at, at the same time. So it's a thread through there that as an overachiever, she can't just write one book at a yeah. time. Yeah. She's writing two <laughs> books at a time. There's probably so a truth you, to that still, yeah. So are you, saying, are you saying if nobody reads this book, you're still worth it? It is. Yeah. Cause I love the, I mean, and honestly, interestingly, even just in the last few weeks, I've started to make it a priority, a couple of work. Cause it's not really work. And this is a little bit of a mindset shift I have to get into, but I also know my, my best time for writing is, is first thing in the morning. So I have blocked my calendar from eight to 10, a couple of times to, to write this fantasy novel, this, this uh, younger, you know, novel. And I've found that it just puts me in such, it's like almost like doing like 90 minutes of meditation. Like it puts me into such a good headspace that I'm not even sure I'm doing less work the whole rest of the day because it puts me into such a great space. And so such a creative space and this very grounded space and calm space. So yeah, it's worth it. Whether anyone, someone will read it somewhere, but (laughs) whether, whether a thousand or a million people read it is definitely up in the air (laughs) that's awesome well this is like kind of a segue into you know our our podcast discover the difference and when you kind of look back and you know you're writing this book for um you know younger people when you look back at you know the younger heather um maybe this heather is in elementary school or high school um what kind of knowing you know what you know today and you know, your experience, what kind of advice would you give her? Yeah, I would just tell her that she is enough, that she doesn't have to prove herself. She doesn't have to prove herself through achievement, but also that like her body is enough and that she doesn't have to change that part of her either. And that she is worthy and valuable and whole and beautiful and radiant and all of these things just as she is and that she can, that she'll she'll live the best life and create the greatest impact just by showing up in her own fullness. Um, and that she doesn't try to do any more than that. She can just be who she is and that that's enough. So, um, that's what I would have told her at that age. I love that. You want to bring some with a difference question? Um, yes. Um, let's see. So, Oh, what do you think is the secret sauce that makes you a success? Oh boy. Um, it feels weird to answer this question because it feels kind of like bragging, which I feel like is also probably a clue that I need to get over that. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I think, you know, one of the things that that people, other people have told me a, a combination of things is that I, my story is both unique and very universally resonant. So like, I am surprised when people read Grounded Wildness. Sometimes I'm like, oh, I didn't know that's what you were going to take away, but that's amazing. Like I'm, I think I'm able to present content, whether that's in speaking or leadership development or in my books, in a way that people personally connect with it, even if my story and their story are not exactly the same. And to also going along with that, to create a space where it feels safe to share it and talk about that. And you mentioned that, Lindsay, at the beginning, just how much participation there was in that imposter syndrome webinar. And that's really important to me. Like I want people, I want there to be more spaces where we can show up and tell the truth and to know that you're not alone and that there's nothing to be ashamed of or there's nothing wrong with you because you feel this way. And I think I'm I'm able to both share my story in a way that people connect with it and then create a space where where people feel safe sharing it and talking about it. So I think I think that's my secret sauce. I, I can confirm that is the case. <laughs> okay. Having having Thank been you. privy to that. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Well, where should uh, listeners go to find more out about you and what's happening next in your life? Yeah, absolutely. So um, two places, my website, which is heatherwellpley.com. And if you get anywhere close to that spelling, you'll probably find me. I think I'm the only Heather Wellpley out there. (laughs) So um, it's heatherwellpley.com. And that has information about my speaking. If you're in the US, you can get 
books right on my website as well, coaching info, leadership development program. And then my main social media platform is LinkedIn. I'm out there pretty frequently sharing things. Um, so that's a great place to connect. You can send me a message. If you have a question about anything that we talked about today, feel free to send me a message and and I'll respond to it. Uh, I'll respond to it there. And then, yeah, what's coming up next in my life? I don't know. We're recording this at the end of June. I'm I'm going to go up to the mountains next week and do a little hiking over 4th of July. And I'm speaking at two different conferences in New York and Minnesota in, in July as well. And so that feels like a really good balance to me to go, you know, search out some wildflowers and then and then go do some great work and get on a stage and be with great people. So good, good balance. Just don't get high things. altitude pulmonary edema. And no pulmonary edema. Yes, I, uh, I am a former luminous first responder, so hopefully I can recognize it in myself or others before before it gets to the point of needing to go to the ER. Yeah, <laughs> Be better than Gabe. It would have been nice if you were there with yeah. us. This, <laughs> somebody would have taken care of me. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a scary thing. So I'm glad that you got Look, you know, what you needed. if you end up needing a ride to the ER, you know we'll get you a limousine. So yes. you know you've got that in your, in your back. Well, I realized that it was the performance part of me that really pushed me to get to the top. Yeah. yeah. Is that interesting? even though I, I wasn't even though I wasn't feeling it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or it could have been that I climbed down halfway back down and grabbed you and drug you out. <laughs> it's a little bit of peer pressure too, huh? Internal pressure uh, and peer pressure. Li- yeah. We literally had to get a guy and pull him up there. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks so much for coming on to the show. It was yeah. really great having you and appreciate all all of our, the insights you shared. This was fantastic. I appreciate all everything that you shared and that you invited me on. Thank you for having me.